Hello everyone, I am Ardhin Dudey. You are watching ADC English Literature. Herein, I am going to carry out a detailed analysis of the identity of a poet. What's the purpose of poetry? How does the author relate to his society? How a poet's identity is established through his literary text, texture, platform, society, universality, and other key features? We will try to get the answers here. But first, what is identity? Poets throughout the world and from any age create literary history and tradition by using and passing on poetic structure and ideas about life and art from generation to generation. They transmit information about the cultural life of the country. Their literature can be a source of pleasure and a stimulus toward the citizen's personal development. Much of the literary importance of poets and their work stem from their use of moments that evoke an identity. In common usage, an identity indicates a realization or understanding that, uh, that comes from any personality. Poet's identity, however, occurred during his literary life. It covers what he produces, the literary text, the wide gamut of text, texture, platform, society, university and many other key features are involved in identifying the identity of a poet. Although great poetry is sometimes said to be timeless, poets think of their writing as part of history and they intentionally imitate earlier poets. The idea that a poem should be original is a relatively recent development dating from English Romantic poets of the early 19th century. In fact, many avant-garde experimenters of the 20th century poets seeking to break with the existing conventions of poetry. They have turned their retention and to ancient poetries or to oral practices that even continue today. The word original contains the word very origin. And for the modern poets, the search for new poetry forms is often a matter of looking back at the past ones. Prior to the 19th century emphasis on the original, imitation of earlier models was not only acceptable but was the standard way of learning to write poetry and becoming a poet in other people's eyes. Even in the New World Canadian or American poetry or in other pockets of African that began, in fact poetry began with poets asserting their voices by writing in the forms of European and English poetry that had been the tradition, that had been the condition of continuity. For poets of the English Renaissance, from about 1485 to 1660, the imitation of classical Greek and Roman poets was a way of earning a place in the lineage of that early artistic and philosophical culture that had glorified the human image in art and writing. Finding their roots in this earlier era was a crucial step for the English poets. They wanted to show how their art was different than that of the medieval period that preceded the Renaissance. At that time, uh, as well as uh, we all know that medieval period was viewed as a dark age in which the glorious cultural identity or the culture of the ancient had been lost or gone to oblivion and ignorance was prevailing than the learning one. Over the ages, many poets have found writings in traditional forms as means of talking to poets of the past, both to acknowledge what they have learned from them and to add their own voices to the tradition. Among poets, Continuing this convention in their own way, the English late 19th and early 20th century poets, houseman and 20th century Canadian experimental 
weight for example and cats both classical scholars juxtaposed ancient and modern poetry to jolt the reader into seeing the continuities of tradition literature according to matthew arnold's definition is at bottom a criticism of life in other words it is a vital record of the writer's impression and reaction to the life that he finds around him a great artist must come into close grip with the reality of life and what he sees or experiences in life is to be transmuted into the work of art by imagination by feeling by beautiful language so literature uh, as an interpretation of life springs from life and it intimately connected with it the greatest of a poet is in the powerful and beautiful application to life in his study of poetry matthew arnold elaborates that poetry is i quote poetry is a criticism of life under the condition fixed for such a criticism by the laws of poetic truth and poetic beauty he further said that an aim of all literature is a criticism of life the greatest of a poet is in the powerful and beautiful of ideas to life in 1943 a lecture made by t.s eliot he says that poet's duty is to only indirectly to the people his direct duty is to his language first to preserve and second to extend and improve we have the feeling that eliot's main interest is in the language and he does not seem to pay attention to what many may regard as the social function of poetry eliot in fact went further and lifted the human being to the point of linguistic abstraction that is too much but it is quite essential that aesthetic view or a poet is for poet's sake or the poetry is for uh, society's sake is the debate that continued now if i add some points on poetry and how the indian subcontinent society has been seen it uh, in the look east if we see in our tradition literary sources for our ancient indian society mainly include the vedic text the epics as well as the indian puranas further in sanskrit literature and in indo-aryan literature the evolution of the ancient societies in india is very well reflected beside these literary sources of the ancient indian societies the various buddhist pali works mainly jakarta's tales and that of uh, jain works also provide significant references to the ancient eras interestingly the rig veda is considered as one of the most primitive written records of indo european language as well as europe in the european society and their considerably high degree of civilization is an example how the poetry was able to depict the society that they live in in vedic sanghitas uh, the origin and other references of the ancient indian societies can be found it mainly includes the yajur veda sam veda atharva veda not only this numerous poetic works there are dramas there are prose that disclose some significant information ab- about the ancient indian societies they mainly they mainly cons- they mainly comprise references about what was considered ideal and what basically happened in the societies of the past so in the ancient indian world 
the, the poets were the artistic articulator and they bear the honor and they also bear the blame. So whatever this is as a reflection, as a mirror, they project it in their work. It was they who had the power to counsel, to sneer, to curse, to make peace and to the point of the vanity of human endeavors. So the poets in Indian ancient world had been much within the society rather than an onlooker from outsider. Now we are going to discuss a few of the key features to establish the relationship between the poetry and the poet. We will shift to some classical text and its explanations. In the Republic, for example, written by Plato in the form of a dialogue, is an inquiry into the nature of justice and the organization of perfect society. According to Socrates, the principal speaker in the Republic, poetry is a nemesis or imitation. He illustrated its relation to the universe by a mirror which turned round and round can produce an appearance of all sensible things. According to Plato, the sensible universe is an imitation of the eternal ideas. Therefore, it is an imitation of an imitation. It is a thrice removed from a reality. Now, taken from another example, Aristotle Poetics, that you have probably read several times or understood a bit, the various kinds of poetry are also defined as marginal life in poetry. A tragedy then is the imitation of action that is serious and also having that magnitude. He says complete in itself. For him, Aristotle finds the action, the affairs of life, you know. Aristotle points out that art imitates nature. Artistic work is both thus natural and ideal. Whereas in his arts poetica emphasizes the aim of his the poetry and declares that every poet should have a close contact with life. The world abroad being the best school. So Horace's Arts Poetica, the longest single work that he um, finds here, uh, Horace extols the great Greek masters, explains the difficulty and the seriousness of the poetic art and gives technical advice to aspiring poets and, uh, and dominated literary criticism through uh, the Renaissance and the 18th century uh, criticism or 18th century uh, literary ethics. So uh, the ideas and ideals explained or verified through different classical writers and their observations had been a uh, torchbearer for future course of studies or future course of poets identification. Now another notable thing I am going to mention here is from Shakespeare's drama Hamlet. Hamlet says to his players that hold the mirror up to nature. So Hamlet's comments seem to carry the ring of Shakespeare's own voice, I presume so. It is Shakespeare who perhaps traces the cult of realism through Hamlet. But when one thinks realism in art, one should do well to keep Sydney as well in mind. Her world is brazen, the poet's world is golden. So what it states Sydney? We may mark the distinction between the brazen world and the world of gold. If one simply keeps the mirror up to the nature, one is likely to reflect the brazen world. But the photographic reflection of the brazen world is the reflection of the journalist. You know, the poet's function is quite different. He remains faithful to the Brazen world, but in him and through him, what is finally reflects is a world of gold. The life, 
that has been reflected or the nature that has been reflected through the eyes of the poet is the golden world but not denying the reality of the present world. The life of D.H. Lawrence, for example, is an object of the world. And when Lawrence is transmuted uh, into the pole in Swans and Lovers, he achieves a new lease of life, a life which follows reality as well as transcends reality. Sydney points out that poesy are an act of imitation, a speaking picture with his end to teach and delight. A Vedic literature provides a glimpse of the vast culture and civilization of the ancient Indian societies, whereas the two greatest epic as well as the Buddhist and Jain religious texts give some significant historical materials about the societies. Arnold says that while poetry goes to serve as a criticism of life, it must abide by the principles of poetic truth and poetic beauty. Philosophy is a criticism of life, but it is not poetry because it has no allegiance to poetic beauty. Aristotle himself is a philosopher, offering a steady criticism of life, but in no sense he is a poet. Poetics cannot be poetry. Though both have the same root in life and both are in their own way critical. Poetic truth aims at the universal while poetic beauty insists on concreteness. In his apology for poetry, Sidney distinguishes between poetry and philosophy. While philosophy is abstract and universal, moreover philosophy is concerned with knowledge while poetry is preoccupied with delight. Of course, Poetry commands delight with knowledge. I cannot escape without mentioning Wordsworthian view. Wordsworth in his two years Skylark forecasts that true creative artist is true to kindred point of heaven and home. In his immortality ode, he truly clarifies the philosophy of life and its significance on earth. It creates a, such an eminent literature where he epitomizes the whole human life through the echoes. Shelley says, a poem is a very image of the life expressed it in its eternal truth. He comments, Poets learn in sorrow what it teach in song. He relates, our sweetest songs are those that tell of saddest thoughts. In Victorian period, the artists like Tennyson, Browning, Victorian novelist, strictly reflects the life and habits through literature. Tennyson is the Victorian voice and he explores the criticism of life of Victorian society through his poetry. His Ulysses and Lotus Sitters reveal the attitude of life of Victorian people. Literature is rooted in reality and at the same time, it breathes something otherworldliness. What's what you see is so similar to the little girl of our everyday world that we can easily identify her as our own. But Lucy in Wordsworth has a glow of her own, a luster of divinity which distinguishes her from the girl of man in the world. The same and similar slightly stand apart. Literature or, for that matter, any kind of art is similar to, but not same as life. The word verisimilitude ought to be examined at this point. The, it means very similar. No art can ignore verisimilitude. Reagan and Gonrell, for example, have their counterparts in our everyday life. When we speak of realism in art, we must take the consideration of the basic differences between art and reality. Art weaves a texture of make-believe paying little attention to possibility. Plato rightly points out that reality, which is an idea, can never be translated. So when poetry goes to translate reality, it misses much of the reality. In geometry, the idea of a line has a length but no breadth. But the moment of the line cannot be translated into the 
material plane understandably when one says that poetry or any other branches of art reflects reality one forgets that reality is beyond reflection that point to be understood so the lecture can be continued unending Literature is only one of the many channels in which the energy of an age discharges itself. In its political movements, religious thought, philosophical speculation, art, we have the same energy overflowing into other forms of expression too. The study of literature will thus take us out into the wide field of history by which we mean the history of political as well as social. Manners, customs, culture, learning, philosophy, religion of a country. A writer is not an isolated fact, but the product of the age in which he lives and works. His picture of life is pervaded with the influence of his age. Uh, we may say that literature is simply a mirror of life, a pre-production and obviously a social document. Literature is the progressive revelation generation by generation, age by age, of a nation's mind and character. A writer is able to give abiding, perennial and universal appeal to work of art. His feet are deeply rooted in his age, but he appears to remain above it. Thus the relation of society and literature is irreparable. I would like to touch upon two key distinct phases which should be applicable to poets or writers in general. They are aesthetic supervisor. Yes, they see the aesthetic aspects of nature, the beautiful aspects of nature, as well as they are social in dedicator. They also preserve the society. With these two principal ideologies, I think all the poets are surviving. The discussion might have been continued further. And even though in this short lecture, I have tried my best to make the points in a nutshell. I must say, if you have any queries or if you have any of further points to be added, just drop queries here on my video lecture. Drop your question, drop your queries, drop your comments. I will try my best to give some answers. Like, share, comment and obviously subscribe to my channel. Bye-bye.